Hidden in tropical jungles, buried in ancient texts, lie mysterious clues to man's forgotten military genius. Is it possible that ancient man discovered the basic technologies that led to one of today's ultimate fighting machines, the battle tank, hundreds, even thousands of years ago? Bulletproof armor invented for a war that killed a king and tore a nation apart. Five-ton armored beasts crushing armies with fear and devastating firepower. Armor-plated shock troops to smash through enemy ranks. And strange forgotten weapons that, like the tank, shattered the balance of power on the battlefield and repulsed whatever the enemy threw at them. Unlocking the secrets of ancient tank tech is our ancient discovery. The tank is built for aggression, mobility, and defense. A potent frontline weapon in conventional battle, it is considered a modern invention. Yet evidence recovered from the ancient world suggests that man has always strived to create weapons with the tank's basic attributes. While the tank was invented in the 20th century, the ideas behind the tank, mobility, protection, and firepower, go back to the beginnings of organized warfare. In India in the 17th century, a weapons system combining firepower with mobility created havoc on the battlefield. The elephant was drafted into war, an animal weighing five tons and capable of moving over rough terrain at speeds of up to 20 miles per hour mounted with platforms carrying heavy cannon fired by specially trained gunners. The ancients understood what a tank was long before they had the ability to make anything that we would recognize as a tank. Today, tanks combine extraordinary mobility with heavy firepower, 125 millimeter guns mounted in rotating turrets. But is it possible that the ancients used the same principles and technologies on the lost battlefields of history? Throughout history, we get lots of stories about elephants and their use. But in a document from 1616, we get a really, really exciting, intriguing eyewitness account of elephants being used in an unusual way. In 1616, British traveler Edward Terry reported that Indian war elephants were armed with heavy guns six feet long, mounted on wooden frames. He states that Akbar, the Mughal king, was using cannon on elephant back. That turns an elephant from a mobile fighting platform and a beast of war, much as a stallion or a battle charger might be, to an animal-powered equivalent to the battle tank. There is evidence that elephants were used in battle in India as long ago as 1100 BC. At first, their main function was to give commanders a better view of what was happening on the battlefield. This is where the Indian kings would have stood in battle. They would have been up on top of the elephant, surveying the battlefield, commanding the position, flying their flags. This is a very powerful way of presenting yourself on the battlefield. Commanders soon realized that elephants could be used in the front line. Massed in their hundreds, charging down on the enemy, the air filled with dust and trumpeting, the earth trembling under their feet. They were a terrifying, chaotic sight. The elephants themselves were trained to pick up horses and riders in their trunks and dash them to the ground, their ruin. They also had their tusks sawn off and fitted with tusk swords. And one such looks like this. This fits on the sawn off end of the tusk, so that instead of the natural end of the tusk, you have this double curved blade with a huge, fat, armor-piercing point at the end, which would make a fearsome square wound in anything it hit. Their function on the battlefield was simple, to smash through the enemy's ranks and wreak havoc on his order of battle. They will break the enemy's formation. They will cause chaos in the enemy's front ranks. They will give you an opportunity to cross the ground, to attack the enemy hand to hand on your terms. Sometimes the elephants carried archers, a specialty that required years of practice, not to mention a supreme sense of balance. But the discovery of gunpowder changed the tactics of elephant warfare. Between the 16th and the 19th century, 
the Indian subcontinent was dominated by one of the greatest states in history, the Mughal Empire, ruled by the Emperor Akbar. Akbar was the third of a highly successful series of Mughal rulers of India. Um, he was around in the 16th century. He was known as a great military innovator. He was driving for technological advantage over his enemies um, in an effort to hold sway over the vast part of uh, the Indian subcontinent. The British traveler Edward Terry is very specific about the weapon he saw on the elephant's back. This is a conjectural reconstruction of what Terry describes. First he uses the word gun. Mounting a cannon on its back would transform the way an elephant was used on the battlefield. The animal would become a mobile artillery unit. The gunner would have a two meter height advantage, giving him enhanced range and visibility. Experimental archaeologist John Naylor has traveled to the jungles of Southeast Asia to investigate the advantages and disadvantages of this ancient tank. But before mounting the weapon, there were other problems the ancients had to solve first. John is investigating each one in turn. The first problem was weight. At the time, heavy cast bronze cannon were the norm. The elephant cannon demanded iron, which is 20% lighter than bronze. This is much lighter than a bronze or brass piece, coming in at about 400 pounds. The second problem is reloading. Most guns in the 17th century were muzzle loaders. The gunner had to walk round to the front and shove the powder, wadding and missile down the front of the barrel. Obviously, if you're balanced on an elephant, you can't walk round to the front to ram the charge home and load it. Cannon forged of iron and not cast of bronze can be made with an opening at the back called the breech. The missile and the gunpowder are packed into a separate cylinder effectively a giant bullet. This is slotted into the breech. This means you can load from the back rather than the front. The final problem to be solved before mounting the gun is how to aim it. Elephants cannot turn on a dime. To be effective, the gunner would have to aim the gun without changing the direction of the elephant, exactly like the turret on a modern tank. The key to how you aim these is in the swivel and the pintle. Just by having it being able to turn left to right, to, to pan, and to tilt, on this point of balance means you've got lots of flexibility in aiming. But to investigate how to aim the elephant cannon in practice, John must mount up. From his position as ancient elephant gunner, John now appreciates the tactical advantage of this ancient tank. The first thing that's amazing about this is the field of view. I can see for hundreds of yards all around. So for a commander, this is excellent as a command point to actually see the whole layout of the battlefield. This is an awesome weapons platform. To test the targeting system, John has modified his replica cannon to fire paintball rounds. Real explosives and real iron cannonballs cannot be used in case they endanger the elephant or John himself. Practice targets have been laid in a clearing on the edge of the jungle, exactly the same terrain that ancient commanders preferred to attack in. Here we go. Yes, that's dead. It's a real learning curve. It's working out the movement of the elephant, the movement of the gun, and the movement of the target in relation to both. John has discovered the trick of the ancient aiming technique. I ended up more like a, a naval gunner, learning to wait for the point where the gait of the elephant is in line with the target. As a weapon system, I think we've shown that it would have worked, especially against packed infantry. You add in bows and other weapons in there, grenades and all the rest of it, armor everybody up, this thing would have been devastating. Over centuries, weapons became more powerful armor became more sophisticated, and elephants themselves changed through breeding and training. Still, elephants survived for over a thousand years as the front-line war engine of imperial armies. But it was not only animals that laid the foundations for today's tank tech. 
Ancient sieges were a forging ground of military innovation. Ancient Discoveries is investigating an armored fighting machine that battered a whole nation into submission. The ability of a tank to smash through obstacles and enemy defenses is essential to its military effectiveness. This capability was also at the heart of the tank equivalents of the ancient world, siege engines. From 300-foot-high armor-plated siege towers to trebuchets, capable of firing burning missiles over a thousand feet. Siege technology is a very advanced, sophisticated thing in the ancient world because of the inherent difficulties of breaking into defended places. In the second century AD, the Roman Emperor Trajan led a campaign against the Dacians, a tribe living on the northern frontier of the empire. Trajan was a new emperor wanting to make his mark. The way you did that as a Roman emperor was by winning military glory. Under the previous emperor, Rome had suffered a series of defeats at the hand of the Dacians, and they'd become almost a traditional enemy. The war is chronicled on Trajan's column, which still stands in Rome. The reliefs show versions of a simple yet brutally effective siege weapon, the battering ram. It's so simple. <laughs> It's, it's, it's what the police use if they want to bash down your door, like batter it down. And you want to attack a castle, well, you need to bash the walls down or bash the gate down. The largest battering rams weighed up to three tons. They were usually suspended by ropes from the roof of a frame on wheels. Teams of soldiers used muscle power to swing the ram back and forth, building up enough momentum to smash through the wall or gate. To protect the soldiers from arrows and stones that could be dropped from city walls, a solid oak frame was covered in wood and animal hides. The problem is, wood and animal hide is flammable. Defenders could pour burning oil or petroleum-based products onto the ram covering, burning the shelter and the men beneath. Ancient engineers came up with a startling solution, chemical fire retardant. The material that was used was, was alum, and this was uh, used uh, to prevent wood burning. Alum is a naturally occurring rock. It's uh, a mineral which contains aluminium, and this is uh, a, a particular rock here from which alum can be extracted. This is alunite. Chemist Nicholas Norman is using alum to cook up some ancient fire retardant. The way in which they would have extracted alum would be to heat this up for long periods of time in air and to keep it moist as well and the physical effect of that is to, to, to turn the rock into a powder and that dissolves in water that could therefore be painted on things like wood alum works by chemically cooling the fire a reaction takes place which actually takes heat in an endothermic process uh, and the effect of that is to take the heat out of the fire in a similar way to water does Ancient model maker Richard Windley has been investigating the ancient texts. He wants to know whether alum really works. What we want to try and do is, is to do an experiment using alum and we're going to soak hessian or canvas um, in an alum solution and then once that's dry what we're going to try and do is to set fire to a piece of the untreated material and the treated material and see what the differences are. The left hand canvas is treated in the ancient fire retardant. The right is untreated. Using a replica ancient flamethrower, Richard puts alum to the test. Hopefully, we'll be able to see that um, the alum-soaked canvas is fire retardant, if not fireproof, and we expect the other canvas to char and burn. Richard's flamethrower uses a combination of sulfur and charcoal to produce flames of up to a thousand degrees. It's just starting to burn. It's not burning very fiercely, but um, we are getting a definite burn there. It took about um, 1 minute 25 seconds to get that burning. It's not burning that brilliantly even now, but um, it's definitely been damaged. How will the untreated canvas compare? That one seemed a lot quicker. Um, we got that one burning in about 27 seconds, and it's actually burning away. So it's fairly evident that this is the actual natural canvas. Ancient fireproofing using alum works better than anyone expected. 
It's several minutes now since we applied the uh, flame to the second piece of canvas and um, as we can see it's actually burning away now and it looks as though it'll keep on burning um, and, until it's pretty much gone now. Whereas the, the first piece, which is the alum treated one, it's almost extinguished completely. It's, there's almost no um, further sort of degradation or, or, or burning has taken place since we removed the flame. So all in all, this is relatively um, an impressive demonstration of what was capable using this alum treatment. The superiority of Roman siege engineering produced victory upon victory. Within four years, Trajan destroyed a nation. He exterminated the Dacians and repopulated the empty country with Roman settlers and pensioned soldiers. The land became known as Rome-Ania, and the nation is still called Romania today. From the Roman siege to the modern battlefield, all military engineers face the challenge of combining firepower, protection, and mobility. Ancient Discoveries is investigating the battle tank of the medieval world an unstoppable steel-plated war machine that smashed through enemy lines. What sets the tank apart from other war machines operating today is its combination of protection and mobility. The medieval equivalent was the knight. This is a trained killer encased in armor and he is a, a medieval tank um, and riding through the front lines of a battle line. The plate armor of the medieval knight is often thought of as bulky and cumbersome. There is a myth that knights were winched onto horses um, and lots of people were needed to assist them to their steed. Yet new discoveries are revealing that the armor of the medieval knight was much more advanced. A knight's training manual written in the 14th century offers intriguing evidence that the fully armored knight was actually a highly mobile and agile assault weapon. The text is believed to have been written by an adventurous French knight named Bossica. He tells us that as part of their rigorous training, knights in full armor practiced leaping onto the backs of their horses, climbing walls, and even performing backflips. When you put a suit of armor on, it can be quite restrictive for the first time. Uh, it, it's very heavy, and uh, as soon as that helmet comes down, it's very claustrophobic. And if you're not used to it, it's very, very daunting at first. So knights used to train religiously in order to get you know, uh, used to it before they went out on the battlefield. The secret of how the full-plated body armor allowed knights such freedom of movement was articulation. Articulated armor is steel armor that joined together with rivets to enable the, the wearer to be encased in armor, yet still move freely. Um, it's very important that the plates are very close together. Full movement can be maintained during combat without failing. The metal joints and rivets in full plate armor mirror the joints in our bodies so that they move smoothly with the actions of the soldier on the battlefield. Actually wearing the full plate armor, you are still very agile and you can still do pretty much anything any normal man can do. Expert horseman Carl Ude Martinez is preparing for the ultimate demonstration of the knight's agility, the joust. On a joust, you need to be able to really move quite well. You've got to be able to control your horse. And not only are you holding your reins in your left hand, you've also got a 12-foot lance in your right hand. A full suit of plate armor worn by soldiers in the 14th and 15th centuries weighed an average of around 60 pounds. This is lighter than the 91 pounds a typical U.S. soldier carries into battle today. For jousting, this light military combat suit was often reinforced with heavier, bolt-on protective plates. Your midriff is protected by the biggest part of the chest and the back that joins together with a strap. Then the cuirass is this bit here, the lathe bit, which enables you to sit in the saddle and is very articulate. That protects from your waist down, basically, and the tops of your thighs. And then I have leg armor on the bottom. As we move up to the top here, as you can see, my shoulder and my elbow protection is in two parts, enabling me to move my arm around. If it was in one part, I would, I would be, I'd find it very hard to move this left arm. One of the most articulated parts of the armor were the gloves, known as gauntlets. Each gauntlet could contain hundreds of rivets and up to 60 articulated separate pieces. These gauntlets that I'm wearing here is probably a very good example of how articulated the armor had to be. You can see that there's 
several layers to this. It's not just all one rigid piece. Uh, fingers had to be very mobile in order to clutch hold of weapons, swords, reins. Uh, you can see there's uh, about 10 lathes there and you can see I can move these uh, very, very easily. Skills used in warfare were also used in jousting. Mounted knights like Basika, who was known as a master of the joust, would charge at their enemies with weapons like the lance to kill or disable them in one powerful hit. Judgment time, I guess. I'm going to be galloping at 15, 20 miles an hour in a straight line with a 12-foot pole. Somebody else is going to be doing exactly the same. So we're going to collide at 30 to 40 miles an hour. The impact is going to be strong. Now it's time to put my trust in the armor that the knights wore from the medieval era. The medieval lance was up to 14 feet in length. It was made of wood, usually ash or oak, with a sharp metal tip made of iron or steel. Its origins are as old as military horsemanship. It began as a heavy spear designed to take out enemy horses and riders. But during tournament jousts, the head of the lance was fitted with a crown-shaped metal cap instead of the sharp point. The purpose of this was to allow the lance to catch onto the shield making it easier to unhorse your opponent or break a lance on him. Actions that scored highly in the tournament. I can move at quite fast speeds in this armor. You know, you really forget about it and uh, your main focus is on the target coming towards you. I'm able to move my body, take my lance across and I'm able to get my shield out. So I'm actually very mobile in the saddle. The combination of protection from full articulated body armor with weapons like the lance and the speed of the horse turned the knight into a formidable shock attack weapon on the medieval battlefield. Used against ground troops in open battle, the knight in full plated armor reigned supreme for several hundred years. By the end of the 15th century, the armourers had cracked it completely. They could make beautifully articulated armour of steel plate, fully hardened and quenched, of the very finest imaginable quality. And if you could afford it, you could be safe on the battlefield from all the weapon systems that were around. The plate armour was so well articulated that when NASA began researching the hard shell spacesuit for the first moon landings, they looked to the 15th century armourers for inspiration. Although plate armor did not make it into space and astronauts found other more advanced materials, the story of plate armor is not over. Within the last few years, patents have been filed in the United States. And the Department of Defense is once again investigating articulated Kevlar armor, though their results are still top secret. As with every successful military innovation, Articulated armor's supremacy on the battlefield was challenged by a new technology, the gun. But as we will see, the armorer's response was ingenious. The medieval world's answer to the gun? Bulletproof armor. Stunning new x-rays will reveal the mystery of how ancient engineers created this life-saving military gear. Amazingly, they reveal that the technique is identical to that used on a modern tank. Today's armored fighting vehicles are protected by duplex armor. Two layers of metal combine to absorb or fragment the impact of the projectile. In front of me, I'll have two slabs of armor, which improve the ballistic protection from incoming projectiles. As time moved on, we discovered using heavier and heavier slabs of armor would just take away the effectiveness of the vehicle itself, making it slower, harder to handle, uh, less effective generally. So we started to use composite armors made up of several different layers of different materials, air gaps or materials such as glass or ceramics because essentially they're lighter. But duplex armor is a much older concept, one that in fact dates back over 300 years. In 17th century England, an arms race was deciding the fate of the monarchy. A civil war was being fought between the royalists, who supported the king, and the parliamentarians, who supported a republic, or commonwealth. The English Civil War left 850,000 dead on the battlefield. This death toll was due mainly to two deadly weapons, the crossbow and the gun. 
The standard issue gun from the 15th to the 19th century was the musket. It could be used against both infantry and cavalry. Guns have been around on the battlefield since the middle of the 14th century. Simple smooth bore muzzle loading matchlock guns which could nonetheless blow a lead bullet through the middle of any armor that any armorer could make. But towards the end of the Civil War, the armorers came up with a technology that reduced the effectiveness of both gun and crossbow, bulletproof armor. The armorer's art has evolved over hundreds of years, and every time a weapon is developed to penetrate armor, it's the armorer's job to defeat that and create something that will stop penetration. Earlier attempts at bulletproof armor struggled to get the balance right between protection and mobility. Armorers could make bulletproof armor, but nobody wanted to wear it. It was getting heavier and heavier, and um, they were constantly seeking ways of getting round the problem of the weight. Ancient Discoveries is investigating how the armorers of the English Civil War unlocked the secrets of lightweight bulletproof armor. It's a journey that begins with a set of discoveries at the Royal Armouries in Leeds, Britain. While using X-radiography on a series of breastplates made in the 1650s, researchers uncovered startling evidence that the armorers were experimenting with technology that was way ahead of its time. They were using duplex armor. Well, one of our most exciting recent discoveries has been these duplex breastplates and they're clearly an experiment that was going on in the middle of the 17th century to make lighter bulletproof armor by doing multiple layers of metal in a single piece. But the X-ray revealed an entirely unexpected feature. We can see here the outline of the two breastplates crimped together around the edges, but also internally to this we have a third piece of armor. This third layer was unknown before these X-rays were taken. And this is actually part of a pikeman's leg arm. It's what's known as a tacit. We can still see the rivet holes in there uh, that help us to identify its function. The breastplate is reinforced by leg armor, astonishing proof that English armorers were using triplex armor systems. But because of the lack of ballistic data from the period, the true effectiveness of duplex and triplex armor against 17th century firearms remains a mystery. We have no ballistic data about shooting bullets at these things because the problem is that we don't really want to shoot bullets at historical objects and destroy them. And I suspect the manufacture of replicas and testing of those as, as, good as, as close as we can to the real thing um, might be the best way forwards. Martin Bavin, a leading medieval armorer, is doing exactly that. Using the same tools and materials that were available to English Civil War armorers, he is recreating the tank-like armor system. The armor that we're recreating, I would say, bears a lot of resemblance to the modern armor used on tanks today. It's obviously evolved a long way and they're using much finer materials. But in principle, the techniques and the idea is the same. To counter the increasing power of firearms, armorers look for ways of making their metals stronger. The repeated heating, banging, and cooling of ferrous metals like iron changes the crystalline chemical structure into a much smoother one. This renders the metal harder, tougher, and more flexible. This is known as tempering. We've got here the inner layer, the central layer, replicating the pikeman's tacit that we can see on the x-ray, and then finally the outer layer. The final piece weighs 10 pounds. It is 17 inches high and 13 inches wide, very similar to the Leeds breastplate. We've built this armor as closely as we can to the original from the illustrations and the x-rays. Weight-wise, we, I think we've got it around the same kind of weight, so hopefully the metal is thick enough. The armor has been brought to a ballistic testing facility operated by Cranfield University in the UK where it will be tested against the firepower of a musket and a crossbow. This crossbow is actually a, a goat's foot lever crossbow. To load the crossbow, you need to put the goat's foot lever on the top. The crossbow is now cocked and ready to fire. And you place the bolt on the crossbow, and away to go. The goat's foot device uses a lever 
which enables the warrior to draw a more powerful bow, double the power of many ordinary bows, up to 350 pounds of draw strength. But even this enhanced super crossbow cannot penetrate the armor. Today, the crossbow may not seem as deadly as the gun, but in the Middle Ages, they were considered so lethal that for many years they were banned by the Pope. Well, the armor seems to have performed quite well here. The, uh, the crossbow has dented the armor, but the, uh, the dents are not very deep and really unlikely to have done anything more than give the wearer a fright. Uh, there's also no sign of any cracking there, so uh, this arm seems to perform very well against the crossbow. But how will the armor stand up to the gun? The team is resetting the lab for the musket, which will be mounted in a clamp and fired remotely. We've got in front of us here today a matchlock musket from the first quarter of the 17th century, still in use up until roughly the 1640s, 1650s. It's called a matchlock because it's ignited by a piece of glowing match cord in the serpent here, touching loose powder in the pan, causing chemical reaction in the barrel, and then we get the projectile coming out of the end. The team will fire a 20-bore iron musket ball out of the 42-inch barrel using two grams of gunpowder the same measure of gunpowder used by musketeers in the English Civil War. With this amount of gunpowder, the musket has less kick than a modern gun. It could be fired from the shoulder. Nevertheless, the muzzle velocity, in other words, the speed of the musket ball when leaving the gun, was 1,400 feet per second. Although deadly if you were hit, the musket was not accurate, and its effective range was little more than 100 feet. So the tactic was for ranks of musketeers to fire volleys all at once to create a wall of projectiles flying towards the enemy, rather than individual soldiers singling out specific targets. This meant that whether or not an individual musket was accurate, it did not matter as hundreds of balls would have sprayed into the oncoming forces with the same effect as a machine gun. The inaccuracy of the musket was overcome in an ingenious way in the battle for Nagashino Castle in Japan in 1575. The musketeers were vastly outnumbered by a superior force of heavy infantry and cavalry. The commanders ordered the front ranks of musketeers to carry three guns each so they could let off all three in rapid succession. 3,000 balls, 200 pounds of fast-moving lead spraying out in less than a minute devastated the enemy forces, and the battle was won. However, the warriors at Nagashino Castle did not have triplex armor. If they had... The ball hit the target, and it took away one layer of the metal and pushed the other two layers into the body. Now, that gave us quite a big bash, quite a, quite a hole, but it didn't penetrate. We've still got two layers of steel that have withstood the charge. The massacre at Nagashino would have been prevented had they had English Civil War triplex armor. Well, this is very similar to the way a modern armor would work, particularly a ceramic-faced composite armor, where it would use a ceramic layer on the front to spread the bullet out and disrupt it, and then a, a composite layer on the back to absorb the energy of the projectile uh, so stopping pull penetration occurring. Our experiment has revealed that the use of multiple layers of metal armor is capable of resisting projectiles. The breastplate was an innovative lightweight alternative to thicker and heavier single layer armor. One thing that triplex armor does prove is that armorers were constantly striving to upgrade their product to make the wearer a lot safer. And this actually shows that by using three layers of steel, it is possible to slow down or even in some cases stop uh, musket balls or pistol balls. Over 350 years later, the same principle underlies the latest developments in tank armor. Weapons on impact will penetrate the initial layer, but then they're exploding into the air gap rather than penetrating through the internal armor and killing the, the occupants. However, advances in armor could not counter the threat of every type of missile. Ancient Discoveries is investigating a rocket-based weapon system that would not look out of place on today's battlefield. The ancient world's answer to the modern anti-tank missile. In the third century BC, Alexander the Great had conquered almost all of the known world. 
Turkey, Syria, Judea, Egypt, and Mesopotamia had all fallen to the most celebrated commander of the ancient world. But in 326 BC, he came face to face with a new threat, the ancient tank. When Alexander's conquest runs across into India, he comes across the kingdom of Porus, and he meets elephants in battle for the first time. The Hydaspes River in the present-day Punjab region of India was the battleground. On one side, 45,000 battle-hardened troops led by Alexander. On the other, King Porus and 50,000 Indian infantry supported by 200 war elephants. Even the best soldiers will be spooked by something as novel, as bizarre and as awe-inspiring as the first tanks or war elephants. So how do you defeat the ancient tank? A manuscript written in the 11th century by the Persian poet Ferdowsi the Shahnameh suggests that Alexander used an extraordinary weapon system. There's a wonderful Farsi poem which says that Alexander the Great defeated Porus's war elephants by building large numbers of iron horses which he filled with naphtha and then set on fire. However, other ancient sources report that it was Alexander's tactical brilliance and heroic soldiers that won the battle, not burning iron statues. He wins the battle and the elephants then come back into post-Alexander Hellenistic warfare. Alexander had achieved what all commanders demand of their anti-tank weapons. To disable the weaponry, pierce the armor, or bring the whole thing to a stop. The ability to take out the enemy's main firepower has always been paramount to winning the battle. If the enemy doesn't have his mobile firepower in his tanks or his elephants, he hasn't got the backup for his infantry on the ground. Therefore, you have a higher chance of winning the battle. But Alexander's victory came at a cost. The 12,000 casualties he incurred from Porus's war elephants left his army unable or unwilling to fight on in their invasion of India. But the precedent had been set. War elephants could be defeated. Elephants are unusual creatures, really, to, to use in battle. They don't like the atmosphere of the battlefield. They don't like the screams. They don't like the smell and the sound of death. And quite often these creatures would turn tail and, of course, actually storm straight through their own ranks rather than the enemy ranks, causing absolute chaos. Military commanders soon began to deploy many kinds of anti-elephant devices that targeted the elephant's weaknesses on the battlefield. One particularly ingenious way the ancients came up with of panicking elephants was to coat pigs in tar and set fire to them. Elephants, unsurprisingly, get very frightened by self-barbecuing pigs heading their way. These poor, kind of flaming, poor kind creatures would charge towards the elephants and send them off in a crazy stampede. But 1,000 years after Alexander's surge into the Punjab region, India was still the ancient tank battleground. The Mughal Emperor Akbar, in his campaign to expand into Gujarat in northern India, was faced with the same problem as Alexander. But now the world had gunpowder. There's a battle between the Mughals and the army of Gujarat. Uh, the Mughals have, have quite a small army and they're using a lot of missile weapons, artillery and rockets. And the Gujaratis are relying more on older technologies, the elephant in particular. During Akbar's campaigns, countless rockets were launched by hand or mounted in wooden frames. The weapons system was even said to be optimized to target elephants by skimming the rockets along the ground. In this battle, a rocket hits one of the elephants and the inevitable happens. He stampedes, the other elephants stampede. A very large Gujarati army is defeated by a much smaller Mughal army using firepower and knocking out their primary weapon system. And this is the battle where the elephant really ends his reign on the battlefield. The weapon that ended 2,000 years of the elephant's domination of the battlefield was not much bigger than a large mouse. Leading rocket experts Ben Jarvis and Paul Birch are investigating how such a weapon system would have been deployed by Akbar's rocket artillery units. From as early as the 13th century, uh, rockets were being used uh, by the military. Um, it wasn't until the sort of 17th or 18th century that they had much more of a defined use. Rockets were, were generally used on the battlefield mainly as a psychological weapon and um, were used for sort of scaring horses, uh, camels and uh, elephants. The text describes the rockets as being 8 inches long and 1.5 to 3 inches in diameter 
The canister of propellant was sealed at one end and strapped to a shaft of bamboo about four feet long. This is basically a replica that we've uh, built of, of one of the 17th century rockets. Um, the casing here would have been made of iron and it's bound onto a bamboo cane with this leather thong. The Indians uh, were using uh, iron-cased rockets probably before pretty much anyone else was. Um, it has a lot of advantages over bamboo cases, for example, which the Chinese use, in that it's able to contain the, the explosive power of the gunpowder much, much better. Um, so they could have packed more in um, and got higher pressure and therefore higher performance out of the rocket. Ben and Paul have recreated a multiple rocket launch system. We've basically got a rack of eight replica uh, Indian artillery rockets here, um, using gunpowder engines, same as the Indians would have done uh, up until the 18th, 19th centuries. Straw bales equal to the width and depth of two war elephants have been set up 120 yards away. Using these sort of uh, old bamboo canes and the, the same sort of technology that they would have used, accuracy isn't exactly uh, uh, guaranteed. So uh, this is probably one of the reasons why they used quite so many rockets. Uh, batteries of eight or ten um, would commonly have been used. On this test, we've, we've got the angle we think about right. So we're hoping that these ones should be fairly accurate. We're aiming for a fairly straight flight. How will the weapons system that ended the reign of the war elephant behave under test conditions? Seen here in 3D, the rocket's trajectories are wild and inaccurate, with no two rockets showing the same line of fire. But just as the ancient engineers must have done, testing the war elephant destroyer involves refining and retakes. We're going to do another test of a single rocket this time. Uh, we've picked one that's got quite a straight stick. We've lowered the angle about another five degrees, so we're going to have another go, see if we can actually get it to hit the target. Despite the team's new calculations of what angle the launcher should be set at, they are finding it a difficult challenge to hit the target. Did the Indian rocket men know something that Ben and Paul have yet to find out? The texts that we have about these uh, Indian artillery rockets tell us that um, they were actually able to sort of hit targets with different diameter rockets um, and, and do calculations to work out what elevation. Having done all these tests today, if nothing else, it, it proves that they, they must have really known what they were doing because it's proven a lot harder than I thought it was going to be to actually hit a target even from fairly close range. The team has set the launcher at 12 degrees. They hope the straight line from launch to target will provide better results. While lowering the degree of fire has brought improved results, with three rockets keeping a lower trajectory, replicating the feats of the ancient Indian rocketeers is proving a very difficult challenge. After firing over 25 rockets, the team have decided to move the weapon system closer to a range of 80 feet. Firing at close range brings success. Well, we uh, finally managed to actually hit the target. Um, if nothing else, we've learned today that these rockets really probably were very, very inaccurate. And in terms of actually hitting a, a fix, let alone a moving target, it would have been very, very hard for them. If you're firing hundreds of them at a time, uh, it only takes one of them to go even near a horse or an elephant, and the, the effect would have been devastating. At this range, the terrified Indian soldiers would have had to wait until the elephants were almost on top of them before firing. Just as today, tank battles were fought with technology, but won by the bravery of the men. I think there are brief moments when the elephant is the tank of the ancient and medieval world, but they're very brief because the innovative thinking of people like Alexander the Great, the Mughal emperors like Akbar, they very quickly realize that they have to neutralize this advantage which the enemy has, and they do so. From fearsome armed elephants to ingenious bulletproof armor, the ancients' arms race to produce the most sophisticated assault and defense systems revolutionized the way they fought wars. Wherever the battleground, Every ancient general called upon his engineers and armorers to give him the upper hand in conflicts that have shaped our history. Ancient discoveries has uncovered weapons technologies that not only defined the ancient world, 
but also laid the foundations for the machines that dominate the battlefields of today.